right now. Military City USA is on the short list to be home to the military's newest unified command. Port San Antonio is among six locations the Air Force is considering for U.S. Space Command headquarters. As a combatant command like U.S. Central Command or U.S. Africa Command, it oversees space operations around the globe using members of various armed forces. Garrett Berger talks with some of the city leaders involved in the application process about our chances and what this opportunity could mean. Port San Antonio, once Kelly Air Force Base, could end up playing host to a combatant command that would focus even farther into the wild blue yonder, U.S. Space Command. It is definitely a feather in our cap to have a command like this in San Antonio. But more than that, 1,400 jobs coming here. And the command's personnel would carry an even larger economic footprint. You've got uh, uh, spouses and children going to our schools. You've got families shopping at our uh, HEBs and, and families that are here. But the competition is stiff. Also on the short list is Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado Springs, which is already the provisional location for the headquarters and host to some personnel and functions now. Here's what I have heard uh, through my contacts is that uh, you know, possession is nine tenths of the law, and, and, and you know, Colorado Springs is theirs to lose. I mean, that's what I have heard. Of course, I don't believe it. Still, San Antonio leaders think Military City USA stands a chance. San Antonio brings together strengths and assets, capacities and capabilities in a way that uh, no other city, uh, regardless of any list, can. I believe. During a trip to the Pentagon in October, Mayor Ron Nuremberg even made the city's case in person. I wanted us to have a very clear uh, presence uh, that we are serious and that we are capable and that we are going to make this a success if given the opportunity. The Air Force says it will be conducting virtual and on-site visits at each location. It expects to pick the preferred one in early 2021. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. New information now in connection with a deadly hit and run over on the northwest side of the city late last night. San Antonio police have now identified that victim. Officers say 61 year old Fred Lee Cameron was crossing the street in the 1200 block of Bandera Road. That was around 11 o'clock last night. Investigators say Cameron was hit by a black Dodge Ram pickup and the driver never stopped to help. Cameron was pronounced dead at the scene. When police catch up to the driver, they say he will be charged with failure to stop and render aid. Those charged in misdemeanor cases of domestic violence, as well as their alleged victims, won't have to wait as long for their day in court. Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez today announcing that instead of just two judges, eight judges will now take turns hearing those cases. Virtual hearings are said to have slowed down the process, especially given the 54% increase in cases being filed since the pandemic began. We are getting ahead as much as we can of the inevitable increase, and we couldn't do it without judges stepping up. A victim's advocate says her clients have been waiting up to a year and a half, risking further abuse. Even misdemeanor cases, she says, some involving simple assault can have fatal consequences the longer that an alleged abuser is, alleged abuser rather, is not held accountable. We are in the thick of the holidays now, and once again, because of the COVID pandemic, we must rethink Thanksgiving. UT Health is offering guidelines to adults, but also to kids in the form of a video played in classrooms around San Antonio this morning. Ursula Perry with what's being recommended. This young lady, one of thousands of children in Northeast ISD, who watched a video explaining how Thanksgiving needs to be a bit different this year. To have a smaller family gathering, just the people in your household, or maybe a couple of other family members that you're close with. Dr. Tess Barton at UT Health is an associate professor of pediatrics infectious diseases, and she has a simple message. Continue being safe, have fun, eat pie. <laughs> <laughs> Joking aside and pie aside, there are some general housekeeping things you can do to keep it fun as well as safe. For group activities like the wishbone break tradition, masks are a good safeguard whenever possible. I mean, I think if everyone's hands are clean and there's just one person on one side of the wishbone and one person on the other side of the wishbone. But you may need to change how the table food is handed out. So rather than having sort of the buffet style or where the things are passed around the table from person to person, um, having one person do the serving. 
The CDC is recommending that if you have a Thanksgiving dinner, make sure it's only about six people from only two households. Meantime, another recommendation, if you're gonna have Thanksgiving dinner at your home, you might wanna throw the party outside, according to our meteorologist, Justin Horn's graphic here. It should be perfect weather. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Meantime, 200 free turkeys, pumpkin pies, and some of the fixings will be given out tomorrow. It's all in honor of the woman who dedicated her life helping out those less fortunate. Verna May Mama Boone passed away several years ago, but her son, Reverend James Robinson of Gospel Vision Music Ministry, has continued her legacy by giving back to his community. My mom raised, raised me to help others, and once she passed away, I didn't stop. So she's looking down on me, doing what uh, she raised me to do, is help others. The turkey giveaway is first come, first serve. There are 200 turkeys, pumpkin pies, and bags of vegetables available. This all gets started at 10 a.m. tomorrow at KCHL Radio. That's at 1211 West Hine Road off of Martin Luther King Drive. Take a look at Time Saver traffic now with TransGuide looking at I-35 southbound downtown at Maine. No trouble spots to report there. Traffic moving along quite smoothly on this Friday as we head into the week of Thanksgiving. As you've probably seen, some of the men here at KSAT are growing beards this month for No Shave November in an effort to raise awareness and fight prostate cancer. It's important to acknowledge that there are men in our area who have fallen to the disease and others who are still fighting that battle. Devin Clark spoke to a local church deacon who is now in remission after battling prostate cancer six years ago and shares the potentially life-saving message he says other men need to hear. Eastwood Community Baptist Church deacon Earl Jameson has a history of cancer in his family. My mother died from cancer. My brother died from cancer. As Jameson got older, he would routinely have to have benign polyps removed from his prostate. Dr. Thomas said, you're a candidate for cancer. but. It's not there yet. One day back in 2014, Jameson noticed that something wasn't right. My side right here kept pushing out, kept pushing out. And when I went to the doctor at Bamsi over there, they checked me and they said I had a hernia. Though painful, the hernia may have saved Deacon Jameson's life. When he went in for hernia surgery, the doctors discovered an even bigger issue, prostate cancer. When you have prostate cancer, you don't know. You don't feel it. It's just like a normal person. The cancer was in its early stage, and 30 days following his hernia surgery, Deacon Jameson was back on the operating table. They say the best way was to go in and clean me out, and that's what I agreed to. While successful, Jameson's surgery left him with some issues. I have what they call a leakage. I have to wear pull-ups. Still at 74, he counts his blessings, knowing he beat the disease unlike his brother. He waited too long until there's nothing they could do for him. With a renewed lease on life, Deacon Jameson spends his time helping Pastor Andrew Roberts run their beloved Eastside Church and praying for the healing of others as chaplain with the disabled American veterans, a walking testament of early detection with a message for other men. I don't want y'all out there today to wait too long where the doctor can tell you, well, we can't help you. A few days ago, Deacon Jameson received a clean bill of health during his yearly checkup. And according to the American Cancer Society, the five-year survival rate for men with localized prostate cancer is nearly 100%. So go get checked if you're 40 or over. Also, go to kset.com for more statistics and information on how you can donate to the cause. Reporting on the east side, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12. And this was Ooh. a picture we were hoping to see this time this evening. You were looking above the University of the Incarnate Word. Light the way has taken place. That's where they turn on all the lights, the beautiful trees all around campus. It's the perfect way to kick off the holidays around here. Absolutely. And now this marks the time of year where I go out of my way to drive by. Because <laughs> right? they're so beautiful. Oh, I love it. So pretty. Love it so much. And a great evening for Light the Way. 73 degrees at the airport, mostly clear skies, and uh, the weather will be pretty quiet for the next several hours. Uh, today's high temperature 81 degrees uh, after our morning low uh, down in the 50s. Elsewhere across South Texas, high temperatures jumped into the mid 80s down well to the south of Highway 90 and a little bit closer to the Gulf Coast. Keep in mind, 
behind that 81 today at the airport was 10 degrees above average for this time of year. So uh, definitely unseasonably warm out there to finish up the work week today. Down to 73 now. Dew point is still in the mid 50s, so we've still got a nice big spread between those two numbers. Uh, but as we head into the overnight hours, those numbers will start to get a little bit closer together. Humidity increases and that'll set us up for some fog tomorrow morning. But again, in the meantime, this evening, really nice out there. Temperatures slowly falling into the upper 60s, mostly clear to clear skies, depending on where you are. And again, tomorrow morning, the fog will be back. We're looking at areas of patchy fog drizzle, maybe even a few little sprinkles here and there tomorrow morning as well. But the whole day won't be gray on Saturday. We'll talk about what your weekend forecast looks like and get you a sneak peek of your Thanksgiving forecast coming up later in the newscast. Taking a look at news around Texas, a massive food distribution in North Texas, about the only way to get this kind of crowd at AT&T Stadium these days. Ahead of the holiday week, there were extremely long lines for a mega mobile market in Arlington. The Tarrant Area Food Bank anticipated that this drive through distribution of food would be the most extensive in its history. Throughout the pandemic, the food bank has seen crowds at its mega markets regularly increase in size due to food insecurity. Today, the food bank was handing out turkeys and whole chickens along with fresh produce, dairy, and additional groceries. And Big lines there. Yeah, we won't soon forget what we saw here at the San Antonio Food Bank. Remember back in April, those mm -hmm. images of thousands and thousands of cars. We're just seconds away now from the coronavirus briefing uh, for today on the count here locally. Again, it is virtual this week, so let's listen in live. Assistant City Manager and Interim Metro Health Director. This is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. I'm finishing up my quarantine, so we are virtual this evening. Unfortunately, tonight, the weekend before the Thanksgiving holiday, we are reporting the highest number of new COVID-19 cases since the July surge, 936 cases this evening. That brings the cumulative total to 72,313 and the seven-day average to 399, a significant jump. Clearly, the virus is spreading in our community, and we need to respond accordingly. This evening, we will be issuing an emergency alert to all cell phones in Bear County. It's going to urge everyone to limit unnecessary outings, avoid social gatherings, and to wear masks. And it will link to the Metro Health Guidance on ensuring a safe Thanksgiving holiday. Please consider spending the holidays only with those who are part of your immediate household. We want to ensure that we have many more family gatherings with loved ones in our futures, so we need to do our part. Unfortunately, we also have seven new deaths to report tonight, all men, four Hispanic males, two white, one black, and, and ages ranging from their 50s to their 90s. Our prayers are with their friends and families, and we hope it reminds you men out there to take this disease very seriously and to get tested for COVID-19 if you exhibit any symptoms at all. Our data shows that men are like, less likely to get tested and more likely to suffer severe consequences from COVID-19 as a reminder. In our hospitals tonight, we have 444 COVID-19 patients in the hospitals, including 62 admissions new since the last 24 hours. 65 of our hospital patients are now from El Paso, and we have 141 in ICU and 66 on ventilators. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And that uh, number 900 and some odd cases today is disturbing. I think we should leave a little time for Colleen. I think she can explain it better to uh, kind of bring it in a context of what happened today with release of those. Uh, so, yes, that's very disturbing. On the other side, it, it looks uh, good for the hospitals. We only had plus four patients and uh, and then we really had a, a minus 10 as far as new patients coming into the system and 12 people less on the uh, in, in, in emergency care. Uh, we had 444, but if you took away the El Paso, which was 65, and that went up four, we're at about 379 in the hospital. So we're managing that, I think, uh, very, very, very well. Now, as far as... Everybody watching what's happening over the next uh, month or so, two months, I guess you'd say, uh, with, with uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, the CDC put out a warning today, and I think it's an appropriate warning. Uh, it's saying celebrate your um, uh, Thanksgiving with your immediate family. I know I've got a large family, 
around here. So we're breaking it up into smaller groups when we would meet and celebrate a little bit on Thanksgiving, but not all getting together in, in one time. CDC also uh, recommended that you avoid travel, that um, try to stay close to home and get us through this season so that when we get to the first of the year, we won't be in serious trouble. Another development that's coming out that uh, I think could be interesting to us as we turn the corner and get closer to uh, what we hope will be a solution, closer to, well, we should have the vaccine out hopefully by the end of the year. Uh, there's a new uh, development by Texas A&M uh, that's doing a breathalyzer test at uh, various events that you may go to and get the results back within a minute. Now, it's probably not as uh, accurate as what we're doing, uh, but that's a new development that might get approval and might come about, and that would be very helpful on some of the events that are pro that, that are that are proposed to be used in, after the first of the year. Uh, Bear County has really concentrated on helping small businesses. Uh, we we put out something like 15.7 million in grants to 1,026 small businesses. Uh, we're doing that through the LIFT fund. That's 15.75 million. Uh, then we also provide another additional million dollars for restaurants and bar associations, uh, businesses to uh, be able to put in the protective equipment. And, and so that, that, that would be uh, going out. Then we also have another uh, 99,000 through SAGE, the San Antonio East Side Development, uh, to do some additional grants that will be done. We'll execute that agreement next, this coming Tuesday. And then Maestro, which is located on the west side of San Antonio, uh, awards will be started giving out on November the 30th, um, giving almost a million dollars there. So total, we put 18 million grants into small businesses to try to help them uh, through this very, very difficult time we're going. Great. Thank you, Judge Wolf. And, um, you know, before we wrap up tonight, uh, the numbers tonight are a little bit different than what we've seen over the last few days and weeks. We've been reporting the seven day rolling average, but we this is the first time we've had a number so high since mid July. So let me turn it over briefly to Dr. Bridger to go a little bit further in depth into what uh, what we're reporting tonight. Dr. Bridger. Thank you, Mayor. So as you've heard, the numbers are sounding um, pretty scary right now. And um, I do want people to take this very seriously. This increase in um, people who are infected with COVID-19 is significant. A couple of things to keep in mind though, when we report out cases every day, that represents cases that have um, been reported over the, or who have been tested over the last 14 days. So this doesn't mean that yesterday we had almost a thousand people test positive for COVID-19. So that's one clarification I want to make for folks. The other thing is the most important number is really that seven day rolling average. That's how we can control for the fact that different labs report at different times. Sometimes they report several days at once. That seven day rolling average helps us kind of smooth those um, peaks and valleys out and gives us a better understanding of what's happening. The last point I want to make is the fact that we are testing more than we have ever tested in the city. Um, even when you look at the peak, we're, we are testing more people today than we tested at the peak um, when we were having, you know, over a thousand people in the hospital every day. And so as we test more, we do expect to find more people. And that's actually a good thing because then we can help those people stop spreading the virus to all of their contacts. And most importantly, avoid that over thousand number of people in the hospital. So I'm, I'm happy to take more questions if the press has any, but hopefully this gives it a little bit more context. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bridger. And as a reminder, if you are contacted because you've come into contact with someone who has COVID-19, take the precautions necessary, quarantine, get tested, and help us stop the spread. Uh, if you are in need of a
All right, some clarification there from Dr. Colleen Bridger, the assistant city manager, as well as the interim, interim director of Metro Health. We saw a big jump in the number of new cases reported today, 936 new cases of COVID-19, the biggest number we have seen in quite a while. She did say, though, that we have to remember that those new cases are from people who have been tested in the last 14 days. So it's not the case that 936 people from yesterday right. tested positive for COVID-19. Some of these cases could date back uh, two weeks. And she also again reminded everyone to look at that seven day moving average to give you the best idea um, of where we really stand. That was a significant jump though from yesterday, 399 cases on average per 24 hours. And the point that she made also is that we are now doing more testing than even we were when we had a thousand people a day in the hospital during the summer spike. So more testing leads to more cases, but that helps them find those cases and hopefully do contact tracing to try to track down those people to uh, let them know what's been happening. Meanwhile, seven new deaths reported today, uh, all men in their 50s and 90s, and they use that as an example that uh, men are less likely to go be tested, but they are more likely to have a bad outcome. So a reminder to keep an eye on the men and for them to uh, keep an eye on their health. Absolutely, and an eye on your cell phone as well this evening. Right. You're likely going to get an emergency alert. Uh, all phones in Bear County, that alert will be pushed to those phones, just reminding everyone where we are in the fight against coronavirus right now and to make sure you're taking all the precautions, especially as we head into the holiday season. We'll be right back. Kennedy Lions will face the Mason football punchers tonight in high school football playoffs. This class 2 AD1 contest will go down to Davenport High School. Kennedy advanced to the second round after Ben Bolt had to forfeit its by district game against Kennedy last week. The Lions are 6-2 and two this season and finish second in district play with a 3-1 and one mark. Head coach Sean Alvarez has really turned that program around. Tonight, they'll battle with the big bad punchers who are 7-4 and four after beating Weimer in the by district round 40-7. Mason Punchers, it's a good program. Um, traditionally, um, Mason's a pretty stout, stout team. Um, everybody knows that. Everybody hears about them and reads about them. Um, they're very athletic. They're very well coached. Um, they, they just, they were in the, the big show a couple of years ago. And so we know what we're up against. Um, they're, 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 uh, they're very good. And so we're, we're, uh, we, we've had a good week. We're excited to be on the field with them for sure. Um, we know that we're gonna have to play our best game in order to uh, to come out on top. Coach took over an 0 and 27 program and then led them to the playoffs last season for the first time since 2015. The last time they made the playoffs in back to back seasons 2010 and 2011. The Lions are on the rise and the Kennedy community is loving it. It has been huge. The turnaround we've made this year is crazy. It, literally everyone talks about us. It's the best thing ever, it's, especially for my senior year. I love it a lot. It's been great. This is a definitely uh, what this community needs right now because ever since the whole pandemic, they have a lot of people haven't been able to watch us, and that now that we're going on the playoffs, it just made them want to come, it made them want to watch us, support us, and then everybody's hyped around here. Oh, the community man, they they call Coach Alvarez every day asking him if we how are we going to beat them, when it's just a bunch of different things. It's just there. I feel sometimes like. They wanted more than us, and I, I, that shouldn't happen. It's just I feel like they wanted more than us sometimes, and they I know they're hyped, and we're gonna give them the dub. Coach also told us the last time Kennedy advanced at a third round was in 1978. Now we have two more games on the road trip tonight: Sagina at Buta Johnson and Clemens at New Braunfels. Highlights of all three on the night beat. Former Bernie champion quarterback Davis Brin led number 25 Tulsa to huge comfort behind win versus Tulane last night. Fourth quarter, six seconds left. Tulsa down seven. Brin rolls to his right, fires a Hail Mary to the end zone, and it's caught by Juan Carlos Santana with no time left on the clock. 37 yards of this game is going to overtime, tied at 21. Brin is third string, but got the play after QB1 and QB2 left with injuries. Tulsa wins 30-24 in double OT, and here's Brin on that Hail Mary. Yeah, I knew it was going to be the last play of the game, so I knew we had guys going into the end zone and uh, took the snap and wanted to buy myself some time and uh, got out to the right a little bit and saw uh, JC and, and all those guys down there and, and threw it up and, you know, came down with it. So. What was it like seeing the, the completion of the referee's arms go up, you know? Yeah, I mean, it was like, it was insane. 
<laughs> like I really couldn't process it. Like I just kind of froze, stood there. I was like, we just scored a touchdown. So let's, let's go win this game. And Tulsa did win thanks to a 96 yard pick six in the second overtime. Bryn, a redshirt sophomore, completed 18 or 28 passes for 266 yards and two touchdowns. He also had a rushing TD, so repping Bernie Champion. Way to go. Getting it done at the next level. Yep. Thanks, Larry. You got it. A special KSAT Q&A coming up next. Our KSAT Q&A looks a little different today, and the subject is a local tradition that looks a little bit different this year, too. Just like everything else this year. Our Steve Spreester is live at the University of the Incarnate Word to talk about this year's Light the Way ceremony. And Steve, that giant switch, it's been flipped for 2020. It has, and it looks beautiful here at the corner of Hildebrand and Broadway at the University of the Incarnate Word. And the way they've set it up this year is it's a drive through event. So we did the kickoff earlier virtually, and people drive through now and drive through the lights. Here you see some people coming around the corner here. It's a drive through event. You start up on the hill, kind of along 281 on the access road there, and then you wind through by the... By the uh, football stadium they have a tunnel set up and all through this beautiful campus and you can see they have different stations as well these are some greeters here with santa you might recognize the guy in the middle there uh, they also have the cheer squad they have red who's the mascot they have so many different things going on here at the university of the incarnate word and i am pleased to be joined by the president of UIW, Dr. Thomas Evans. Thank you for staying with us after this event started. My pleasure, Steve. What does Light the Way mean to this community? I think it's really the kickoff of the season. We're truly lighting the way for Christ's arrival, and we like to be the first in the city to, to do it. I know maybe this year there were some that, that beat us to it, but to have the ability to have the, the whole community here, to be on campus, to share in the spirit and the joy of the season is a wonderful tradition. 34th year now. Did, were there were you contemplating not doing it this year because of all the, the COVID concerns? I don't think that was ever ever in the cards for us. <laughs> we had to do something. We just needed to, as we've done this entire year, do something different, pivot, make it work, make it accessible, make it joyous. And uh, and I think that we've pulled it off. This is a great group coming through. And, and the, the changes that we've made to bring people through the campus and tunnel and have it Truly, with lights the entire way, a million lights. Uh, I think we've I think we've done a good job. It, it, very proud of the community. Obviously, it's quite an undertaking every year. I mean, I think they start in August putting up That's these right. lights. One million lights. It's been going for 34 years. What does it mean to the student body? I think they really look forward to it. They actually change the bulbs every year. Volunteers come and they change the entire strands. Our electricians are working for months to get them out. So it's a, a new endeavor each year and I think it's something that they look forward to because it's it's there's some ownership of it, of, of doing it, but also then sharing with the community, which is something that we want all of our students to do with service that they, that they give back to the community and they give back to others. And perhaps this year more than the normal year for Light the Way. Very different. The whole campus is very different. We've really had to what we call pivot to uh, to a new way of, of, of teaching and learning in, in some ways, although we've been doing online learning for 20, 20 plus years. So we've been able to move virtually, but also have in-person classes, labs, our health professional schools never stopped, never slowed down. And, uh, and we, we have about 700 residents on campus right now. We've done more testing, I think, than any other institution, over 5,000 tests asymptomatic tests we've had very low incidents and i'm really again proud of our community it helps to have all these health professional schools and, yeah. and doctors and epidemiologists to help us out and uh, and we've gotten great cooperation from everyone in the community to stay safe have you done a lot of virtual and in-person classes we have we almost every imaginable format so completely online labs that that even have a, a component that might be virtual a hybrid then we have we have asynchronous, synchronous online, and this next spring we'll have we'll have more. We're actually doubling the number of face to face. We have good practice now. We know we know what we're doing with the, the testing too and how it's working. So we feel much more confident that we can add more. But we're also going to keep with the asynchronous and synchronous and and do this in safe formats. Things outside, music outside. Yeah. Our, our faculty have been incredible. They really are the entire community in, the, in this shift. They did it quickly. They did it seriously. They did it with the students in mind and safety in mind. And I'm, I'm just so proud of the way they've 
done everything throughout this this pandemic. Has UIW taken a financial hit because of the pandemic? Uh, undoubtedly, there there are there are going to be things that are that are problematic, or housing, auxiliary services, dining, uh, events, you know, athletic events, theater, all of those things that that have some kind of revenue. They're going to they're going to have a an impact on on you. There are some savings too. There's not as much travel. But in the end, uh, you know, we, we've had to adjust our budget for a, a, a pandemic budget. I'm very proud that we've met that that budget, and uh, and we'll continue. But there is there is a financial hit for higher education for sure. I appreciate your time, Dr. Thomas Thank Evans, you. the president of the University of the Incarnate Word. All right, I'm going to put my UIW mask on, and I'm going to walk over here. You'll be able to hear me, right, Lee? All right, and 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 I want to say that all the tickets are sold out. This is a three night event. All the tickets are sold out right now for people driving through. Uh, you could have registered online. But this is, you know, we've got Santa here in the middle. I don't want to miss the chance to put Santa on live on KSAT 12 <laughs> and all his helpers. He's got elves here, you know, so they have little stations set up as you drive along here through this beautiful campus uh, to bring light the way to the people, even though we're in the middle of a pandemic. Tim and Myra, back to you guys. It looks beautiful, even if it was virtual this year. It's fantastic. An annual tradition and one that you've been a part of for quite some time now. Yeah, definitely. We'll be right back. A pair of Harry Potter fans in Brazil bringing the flying brooms to the real world, kind of. They designed a method of transportation called cloud brooms. It's a metal frame on an electric monocycle with a broom as a seat. It's a monocycle with a broom on it. Okay. But the idea <laughs> is to bring the sensation of flying on a magic broom to the real world. The two friends now are finishing the product's price and marketing details to release it for sale for all those Potter fans. But uh, good luck. I can uh, sense that Gerber is not feeling the magic no. when it comes to <laughs> Katie, are you surprised in any way by that? No, 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 okay. no not at all. Um, I love the people that love Harry Potter that much, though. Yeah. Uh, yes, Just they are dedicated. Props, yeah, for the dedication. Um, as you saw in Steve's live shot, it's pretty comfortable out there. We're sitting in the low 70s, but it's not overly humid at this hour. It will turn more humid overnight as our temperatures fall into the 60s and as our dew points climb into the 60s. This will set us up for some more fog, maybe even a few sprinkles early tomorrow morning as we kick off the weekend. I'll have a look at your full weekend forecast and even a sneak peek of what Thanksgiving has in store coming up in just a few minutes. Some bad buzz for one of Tesla's most anticipated electric vehicles. Consumer Reports says the Model Y is not recommended. Reliability woes, one of the biggest concerns from that group. The Model Y began production at the start of 2020 and is expected to become Tesla's best-selling vehicle. But wait, there's more. Consumer Reports says people have complained about misaligned body panels, mismatched paint, and one owner reported dust, debris, and even human hair stuck in the paint. Ooh. Because of Model Y's rankings, Tesla has been placed near the bottom of the magazine's industry-wide reliability ranking. Now it is ahead of only Ford's luxury Lincoln brand and just behind Volkswagen, which finished in last place last year. The reliability rankings are based on a survey of actual owners. No word from Tesla about that rating. Doesn't sound good. No. Oh, you know who's really reliable? Katie Blake. Katie Blake oh, okay. in the forecasts. We had to work that in there for you. <laughs> Thank you. And the emails will come pouring in. People will be like, wait a second. Um, <laughs> Weather. Fan mail. Forecast joke. Yeah, forecast joke. Um, <laughs> the weather will be pretty even keel over the course of the weekend. We're going to keep things warm and humid, not necessarily very fallish over the next couple of days. We do have two fronts in the forecast. One is going to be much stronger than the other, and that one will actually set us up for what's looking like a nice Thanksgiving next week. 73 at the airport now, 75 in New Braunfels, mid to upper 60s in the Hill Country. And again, our dew points are still on the lower side for now, 50s even some places in the 40s off to the west of 35. So that's really not feeling too bad at all. But these dew point numbers will be climbing overnight into the 60s. Our air temperatures will be falling into the 60s. And around dawn tomorrow morning through about 8, 9 o'clock, those two numbers, air temperatures and dew points will overlap, even be equal in some instances. And that is what sets us up for another round of fog early tomorrow morning. So 
through 10 o'clock, maybe a little bit of patchy fog down on the coastal bend, but it will be after midnight closer to dawn tomorrow morning. That fog becomes a bit more widespread. Now I'm not expecting to see this many places with visibility down to zero early tomorrow morning, but there certainly will be areas of fog and some of that fog could be dense for a couple of hours. So keep that in mind if your plans take you out early tomorrow morning. We're going to do that all over again on Sunday. So this weekend, keep in mind the mornings will be kind of damp and gray. Along with the fog, there could be a little bit of drizzle, maybe even a few sprinkles as well. But in the afternoons, we'll shake all that off, try to get a little bit of sunshine going. I think partly cloudy afternoons Saturday into Sunday, boosting our afternoon temperatures uh, to near 80 degrees. And I've just realized that I left the clicker that I need for this graphic over there. I'm just going to stay here and skip ahead. What I was going to show you is that we've got those two fronts coming in next week. They will come without a chance of rain, unfortunately, uh, but they will drop our dew points, especially that second one as we get into the middle of next week. I'm going to you brought it for me. Thank you, Jesse. This one. OK, we're going <laughs> to go through uh, the graphic here. So this is that's the trouble with having two clickers. You may forget one every now and then. So here's the first frontal boundary that will sneak through Sunday night. This will come maybe with a little sprinkle here or there, and it will drop our humidity a little bit into Monday, but then we'll rebound. Southerly winds kick back in Tuesday. We'll be humid again ahead of front number two. This will move through Tuesday night into early on Wednesday, and it is the second front that is going to drop our humidity a lot more by the middle of next week. Look at our dew points dropping from the 60s on Tuesday into the 30s Wednesday and Thursday. That low humidity will make it feel very fall like. Yes, for Thanksgiving on Thursday, this graphic. I love this graphic. I we can't take credit for it, uh, but it is a fun graphic. That's for sure. We've got all of our our but Justin pointed this out. The turkeys and then the, they're eating the turkey. So maybe it's like tofu turkey. That's what I'm going to choose to believe. But here's your early Thanksgiving Day forecast. Mostly sunny, drier air in place and an afternoon temperature in the 70s. So looking pretty good there and behind that second front we could have morning lows Thursday uh, in the mid 40s there. So looking good for Thanksgiving next week. In the meantime, I'm going to get through a warm and humid weekend. Keep in mind uh, early parts of the weekend here in the mornings will be uh, featuring more fog and maybe a few little sprinkles. Guys, I think those turkeys might have been attending a wake for one of their brothers. <laughs> <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> Gerber just rounding us out here <laughs> in case you missed it coming up next. I want to tell you about a traffic trouble spot on Time Saver traffic here tonight. This is over on the west side at Loop 410 and Highway 151. We understand this is happening on the access road. You're kind of looking back towards West Military. Uh, we understand there has been a rollover accident there, obviously causing big time trouble over there for those cars on the back side of this. Yeah, a lot of first responders flashing lights. You can see there are plenty of tail lights too. Looks like traffic is not moving uh, behind this accident. Again, as Tim said, a rollover along the access road here in this area. So certainly if you're headed that way or know someone who's coming from that way, expect some delays. Try to get some more information and bring that to you a little bit later on the night beat. Meanwhile, here's today's in case you missed it. Good morning to you. We hope you slept well last night or had a good overnight shift. It is Friday, November 20th. Happy Friday. Thank you for being with us this morning. Deadly crash overnight. Police tell us 38 year old Robert Lee Collett Jr. was driving a pickup truck when he crashed into a white Honda Civic. Officers on scene tell us Collett appeared to be intoxicated. The woman inside the Honda Civic died at the scene. We're still waiting to learn her name. A woman is facing some charges after she stabbed a man at a bus stop early this morning. Police tell us 39 year old Amanda K. Smith was arrested right there on the scene. She's facing charges of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. The 16 year old suspect has been sentenced to 10 years behind bars on a murder charge. He was convicted in the November 2019 deadly shooting of Sean Marvin Baker. Baker was shot in the 2100 block of Sundrop Bay during an attempted robbery. Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez today announcing that instead of just two judges, eight judges will now take turns hearing those cases. Virtual hearings are said to have slowed down the process, especially given the 54% increase in cases being filed 
since the pandemic began. Beginning to look a lot like Christmas here in San Antonio. Overnight, the city put up lights and decorated the tree over in Travis Park. This year's tree is a con color fir from northern Michigan. It will be decorated with more than 10,000 red, white, and blue lights. <gasps> If you want to see what kind of innovation has happened in the year that's been dominated by a worldwide pandemic, you might want to pick up this issue of Time Magazine. It features its annual list of the 100 best inventions of the year. Some of the things that made the list this year include an artificial intelligence powered beehive. Running shoes wouldn't normally count as an invention, but a running shoe made almost entirely from natural materials does. It's made of things like eucalyptus, merino wool, castor bean oil, and sugar cane. And new technology based on the general material called mRNA that led to the development of coronavirus vaccines in record time. That double issue is on sale now. I know it's not high tech, but the candy shoots for Halloween. Yeah. That's probably one of my favorite inventions yeah. of 2020. <laughs> that one may stick around uh, after the pandemic's gone. I like that one too. A look at it. Your weekend forecast mornings will be marked by the low clouds, a few sprinkles and some fog in the afternoons, mix of sun and clouds, and that'll push our afternoon highs to near 80 degrees. So that first front is pretty weak that comes through Sunday night. That'll drop humidity briefly into Monday, but it's the second front Tuesday night that will really, really drop our humidity and set us up for a couple of great days Wednesday and then things Thanksgiving on Thursday. Toward the end of next week, though, we'll see the moisture return, and that will hopefully aid in a couple of isolated showers. Guys. All right. Thanks, Katie. And thanks for watching the news at 6. Have a good evening. We'll see you back here for the Night Beat tonight at 10.